50 million years ago. A hungry land animal seeks a new source of food. This sets him on a spectacular evolutionary journey and on a collision course with rivals. Today, this creature looks like a fish, but it retains key traits from its terrestrial past. It's warm-blooded, a mammal, and breathes air through its lungs. So, how did a creature built for land become master of the oceans? Asia, Pakistan, the Suleiman Mountain Range. This rocky terrain was once the bed of the ancient Tethys Sea. Locked away in this rock are the secrets of ancient marine life and death. In 1978, a team of fossil hunters from Michigan goes to work. Paleontologists are time travelers. They visit the ancient past by digging into the earth. Each layer of rock is like a time capsule, recording major events in the planet's history. Asteroids. Natural disasters. Climate change. It's all recorded in layers of rock, planet Earth's DNA. team member cracks open a rock. Inside is a fossil, unlike anything they've seen before. This fossil sends one man on a voyage of discovery. The expedition leader is Philip Gingrich. In the University of Michigan vaults, he examines his amazing find. It's the partial skull of a mammal that lived 50 million years ago. In 1978, Gingrich couldn't figure out which family of animals it belonged to. When we found it, when we cleaned it, I really wasn't sure what it is. I was a specialist of land mammals. And it didn't look like anything I knew. Gingrich commissions experts in mammal anatomy to reconstruct its skull. gives you an idea of what the whole skull might have looked like. This is real and this is reconstructed, but it's reconstructed following the plan of a typical mammal. Later expeditions uncover more crucial pieces of the skeletal jigsaw. Finally, this enigmatic animal comes to life. I think it would have four limbs. 
I expect probably it had sh short hair. And they still have hooves. If we think it's a land animal, we'd expect it to look wolf-like. But Gingrich still can't identify which order of the animals it belongs to. Then he spots a tiny S-shaped bone in the ear region. He finds out that this bone is known as a sigmoid process and is unique to one particular order of animals that lives in the water today. Gingrich finally discovers what this creature is. It's something primitive, it's something transitional, but nonetheless, with a sigmoid process, a primitive whale. This can only mean one thing. The modern whale began life as a land animal. To find out how a land animal evolved into the modern whale, we must return to ancient Pakistan. This is the ground the creature walked on 50 million years ago. The world then is a hotter place. In this region that is now Pakistan, higher temperatures likely create an arid environment. The whale's ancient ancestor, named Pachycetus, faces a survival crisis. It's the shape, size and weight of a modern wolf. And lives on a diet of plants and small animals. But climate change is wiping out his food supplies. He needs to find a new food source, and quickly. The ancient whale takes its first tentative steps into walk. It is an extraordinary gamble. What rewards do the waters hold for Pachycetus? The answer lies in the earth itself. Fifty million years ago, the land masses of planet Earth drift further apart. This creates new ocean currents. These currents convey warm water and air from the equator to the polar regions. Warmer poles mean a warmer planet. Hotter temperatures can boost photosynthesis, producing an abundance of marine life. Pachycetus finds a banquet of food in these shallow waters. I think they probably started as scavengers, running along a strand line, feeding on dead fish that washed up on the shore. And once you're in the water feeding on dying fish, it's a logical step to try to catch other fish. Just as Pachycetus solves one crisis, food, 
faces another. Predators. To swim, Pacasitas has to paddle like a dog. It's a poor design, making him a slow and clumsy swimmer. Fifty million years ago, Pacasetus disappears from the fossil record. What happens after Pacasetus? How does this land animal evolve to become king of the oceans? Whale ancestor, a land mammal named Pacasetus, disappears from the fossil record. In 1994, 16 years after Philip Gingrich discovered the remains of Pacasetus, one of his former students makes the trip to the same region of Pakistan. Hans Thewison is seeking ancient land animals. In rock dating back 49 million years, he discovers the bones of an unknown creature. The first day we found a hind limb. The next day we found some vertebrae and some ribs. And the third day we finally found a skull. And I still didn't know what it was. This creature appears to have legs like a land animal, but feet like a duck. I got very frustrated with the fossil having this beautiful skeleton and not knowing which animal this was. Then he spots a bone unique to one order of animals living today. And then it struck me, this is an ear bone, and it's the ear bone of a whale. That finally made the penny drop. And I realized that now we finally found this amazing skeleton in this transitional whale, a whale with legs. It struck me that we caught evolution in the act here. This is why Pacasetus disappears. It simply evolves into a new species. Poor swimming skills make Pacasetis vulnerable, so it adapts in three key ways to swim better. His tail develops muscles and flattens like that of an otter. His back legs shorten and widen to act like flippers. He becomes more streamlined.
Viewerson names this new species Ambulocetus natans, which means the walking and swimming whale. Sometime in the ancient past, a whale ancestor evolves the skills to live permanently in the oceans. Viewerson's next quest is to find out if Ambulocetus is the ancient whale that adapted to live in the seas full time. If a land animal drinks seawater, it can be lethal. To live in the ocean, Ambulocetus needs to adapt to cope with salt water. This ancient whale's kidney isn't preserved, so scientists look elsewhere for clues. When you're studying teeth, you really get a good idea of lots of different aspects of the life of the animal, such as its diet, where they were living in water on land, and which waters they were drinking. Fewerson expects the teeth to show Ambulocetus lived in the ocean. But the results are a surprise. They reveal that Ambulocetus drank fresh water. It had to stay close to rivers and lakes. This whale ancestor still lives primarily on land. We were surprised because modern whales can drink seawater. Their ancestors were land mammals and therefore freshwater drinkers. So somewhere that transition had to happen, moving from fresh to sea. But it hadn't yet happened 49 million years ago, and this raises an intriguing question. What prevents Ambulocetus from fulfilling the whale's destiny of life in the ocean? Fifty million years ago, the whale is a wolf-like land creature that hunts in shallow waters. One million years later, it evolves three key features to swim better. A stronger tail, legs, and a more streamlined body. Despite being more aquatic than its predecessor, Tests show that Ambulocetus, or the walking and swimming whale, lives mostly on land. To find out why, Fewerson returns to the skeleton. It's a complete Ambulocetus based on the one he found, and it gives away a surprising secret. This species has a large head and body, but relatively small hind legs. I think in water, Ambulocetus wasn't a very strong swimmer. It certainly couldn't pursue fish because the fish would be much faster than it. We think that it was a predator. It'd probably hang out in shallow water, sort of hidden and waited for prey to come up to it and then would lunge it to catch them. 49 million years ago, this poor swimmer faces grave danger hunting in even shallow seawater. If you look at the shallow marine fauna of that time, there are lots of big predators, such as big sharks, much bigger than the whales. They would certainly have been eaten and would have competition from crocodiles and sharks uh, if they were hunting prey. Was it safer on land? 
I think Amulcetus would have been pretty clumsy on land. It would have been similar to a sea lion or maybe a crocodile. They would have been slow, lumbering, and mostly with their, with their bellies on the ground as they were resting on land. Poor in both land and marine habitats, 49 million years ago, Ambulocetus vanishes from the fossil record. The mystery of whale evolution deepens. When and how did the ancient whale evolve to live full time in salt water? Scientists work to discover the secret to its transformation from clumsy land animal to master of the high seas. In 1994, Philip Gingrich from the University of Michigan returns to the Suleiman mountain range in Pakistan. It was here, 16 years earlier, that he unearthed the oldest whale ancestor. His quest now is to find the first ancient whale that lived permanently in the sea. They're extraterrestrial in the sense that they left the earth, they left the land, and live in the sea today, which is a little like outer space, really. And the change to be able to live there is big. They get to work, using only the tools they can carry in a backpack, hammers, trowels, and brushes. The team discovers the skeleton of another ancient whale. They wonder if this species could be the elusive missing link that cut its ties with fresh water. Back at the University of Michigan, they carefully begin separating clean bone from mineral. Tests on the mineral rock reveal this creature lived 46 million years ago, three million years after Ambulocetus. Ambulocetus was a poor swimmer, struggling to escape predators and struggling to hunt. This species evolves a series of adaptations to swim better. He has a shorter, more powerful neck, better for diving. His rear legs widen and become more flipper-like. His tail develops muscles. However, the teeth of this ancient whale reveal something far more significant. Just four million years after the whale ancestor Pachycetus first enters fresh water, this whale lives permanently in the sea. This is the first whale that really took to the sea. And to be honest, we didn't believe it. The secret to its success and the survival of the entire whale species lies in a tiny but ingenious device inside its trademark ear. Paleontologist Philip Gingrich unearths a whale that lived 46 million years ago. He names it Rhodocetus. Inside Rhodocetus is the key to an age-old mystery. How did the ancient whale, a land mammal, adapt to survive in the ocean? 
there are a few clues in its skeleton. It is 10 feet long and similar to Ambulocetus. The ancestor that three million years earlier had only been able to drink fresh water. Now this new species lives in the oceans and spreads out across the globe. How has it adapted to this salty new world and why don't vicious marine predators wipe it out? This becomes one of the single greatest mysteries of whale evolution. Fearsome predators stalk the Tethy Sea. For sharks and crocodiles, ancient whales are easy prey. To survive, Rhodocetus must find a way to escape predators. The key to how this ancient whale survives the ocean is hidden inside its most distinctive feature, the ear. Professor Fred Spohr studies a vital organ that's situated inside the inner ear of just about every creature. Called the organ of balance, it is key to the survival of Rhodocetus. The organal balance inside the inner ear is an absolutely vital, a key organ to function for any animal. To understand what saves the ancient whale, Spore produces a model of a human inner ear, enlarged 12 times. The organ of balance consists of three canals at right angles filled with fluid. The fluid moves when the head moves. Nerve cells register these fluid movements and send signals to the brain. The brain instantly decodes these signals and adjusts the body's balance so it doesn't fall over. However, acrobatic behavior causes the liquid in the inner ear to slosh around, sending scrambled messages to the brain. This causes dizziness. The inner ear controls balance. But how did it tilt the balance of survival in favor of the ancient whale? Spohr finds the answer when he compares the human ear to that of the whale. If we now, for comparison, actually look at the inner ear of a whale that has also been enlarged 12 times, then we can see that there's not that much overall difference in size even though whales are, of course, much larger than, than humans are. However, the enormous difference is that the bit that deals with balance, here and here, is enormously reduced in the, the whale. The whale's inner ear is so small that the liquid inside barely moves. This allows them to turn and twist at high speeds without getting disoriented. Some 45 million years ago, the ancient whale's organ of balance was shrinking. And for good reason. It makes him agile enough to outmaneuver predators. Rhodocetus survives and continues to evolve. But its descendants are about to face dramatic climate change and a terrifying new predator. Egypt, the Western Desert. 93 miles southwest of Cairo, 
These part sands harbor secrets more ancient than the pyramids. Philip Gingrich has been excavating this site since 1983. In that time, he's unearthed giant whale skeletons. These ancient whales are so large, they're named Basilosaurus, which means King Lizard. But what are these whales doing in the desert? Of course, the whales didn't really live in the desert. This was all a shallow sea before, and one that was full of sunlight, clear water, teeming with life, including archaic fossil whales. It's an 18 meter long, 50 foot long whale that you simply can't miss. Being so large, there's no doubt that Basilosaurus was the top carnivore, the top predator in this ecosystem. The equivalent, if you will, of T-Rex farther back in the past. 39 million years ago, this is the bed of the ancient Tethys Sea. By now, Basilosaurus thrives in oceans and seas all over the world. Especially in the food-rich waters of the Tethys Sea. Basilosaurus has evolved a set of impressive tools for hunting. Exceptional eyesight. Improved underwater hearing. And a long, thin body shape to hunt in shallow waters. And from its terrestrial past, it retains two useless remnants. The most interesting thing about Basilosaurus is the retention of hind limbs with all the bones right down to the tips of the toes. So they are a vestige of a former life on land. Basilosaurus weighs in at a massive 13,900 pounds. Its change in size turns it from the hunted into the hunter. Now, the tables are turned on an old foe. The shark. Sharing the waters of the Tethys Sea with Basilosaurus is a smaller, more vulnerable whale species. The Duradon whale most resembles a modern dolphin. It has a powerful vertebral column and short flipper-shaped forelimbs. And like the modern dolphin, it has a tail fluke. However, at just 16 feet long, it's much smaller than Basilosaurus. There's even some evidence that Basilosaurus preyed on young, if not adult, Dorodon. One theory is that to protect themselves from predators, Dorodon whales swim in pods. Only one of these two species survives to become an ancestor to the modern whale. But which will it be? The small hunted Duradon? Or its massive predator, Basilosaurus? Whale evolution spawns its next great unexpected twist. Fossil records show that 36 million years ago, the mighty Basilosaurus dies out. Researchers want to find out why. Gingrich has been trying to solve this conundrum for many years. He looks for clues to the mystery beneath the sands of the western desert. 
Gingrich believes that Basilosaurus evolved its eel-like body to hunt in shallow waters. Its body shape is perfect for hunting in bays like this one. But is it a victim of its own adaptation? Thirty-five million years ago, planet Earth is changing dramatically. Oceans continue to cool. Antarctica has split from South America and develops a permanent ice cap. Water that once flowed down into the oceans remains frozen at the poles. This causes a dramatic drop in global sea levels. Shallow coastal waters disappear, forcing Basilosaurus to hunt in deeper waters. Its eel-like body struggles in this deeper water. It lacks the power to dive. Maybe it's only good for living in surface water. Maybe once you need to dive to get food, it wasn't so good anymore. Short and muscular, the Duradon has no such problems. This is the whale species left to inherit the Earth. I would think that the success of Duradon depended on its conservative body proportions. It's the one that succeeded, ultimately. Duradon survives, but the future of the whale species is in grave danger. Later ancient whales face what many consider the most terrifying predator in history. Predator so big that each one of its teeth is the size of a man's hand. A dramatic twist in the journey of the modern whale takes place 30 million years ago. In the cooler seas of the mid Atlantic, the ancient whale is 16 feet long and dwarfed by a terrifying new predator. Monster sharks. Weighing in at more than 100,000 pounds and over 52 feet in length, the megalodon shark's mouth is so large, a human could stand upright inside it. Even whales aren't safe from such a fearsome predator. Megalodon stops dead in his tracks. Unwittingly, Ancient whales have stumbled upon a surefire way for their species to flourish for millions of years. To escape, they head away from the equator towards the new chillier polar seas. Thanks to their warm blood, they can handle the cold water. But their predator can't. Sharks are cold-blooded. Their body temperature is the same as the waters in which they live. In colder water, their bodies shut down. Megalodon was tied to a warmer sea and didn't survive this new cold world. These polar waters are safe from Megalodon and rich in food supplies. 
But the whale's problems are far from over. The ancient whale must develop the most sophisticated marine tools in the natural world. Evolution arms predatory toothed whales with a high-tech device to hunt. Sonar. They emit a focused beam of high-frequency clicks. The sound bounces off any object in its path. The whale decodes the returning echo and determines the size, shape, and speed of the object. Known as echolocation, the whale uses this to pinpoint and then swoop in on shoals of fish. And their bodies automatically adapt to hunt in deeper waters. Whales can control the flow of blood to their hearts and brains. As a result, they don't suffer a lack of oxygen on deep dives. This leaves them free to engage in typical mammal behavior. Like mating, socializing, and showing off. Especially the most expressive members of the whale family, dolphins. They're big-brained. Dolphins and porpoises are big-brained relative to their body size. They're very personable if you ever meet them face to face. You have a sense that there's a, a sentient being there that reminds us of ourselves, I think. Today, there are more than 80 whale species. The largest is the blue whale. It has a heart the size of a Volkswagen Beetle and the tongue the size and weight of an African elephant. Other whales have evolved incredible survival skills. The gray whale can swim more than 12,000 miles in an annual migration. Orcas can reach speeds of 34 miles per hour. And bowhead whales can live for over 200 years. The journey the whale has made to get this far is truly amazing. From its wolf-like ancestor, its struggles between land and water, before finally adapting to the ocean. It's like the Rosetta Stone for evolution. A lot of textbooks use the whale as their example for evolution because it's now so well documented. I like it because it's big and I like it because it's backwards. 